the algorithmic question that people ask here is, what's the right thing to do? You know, when you don't know anything about the distribution of quality, in our case, you know, you have no idea how to assess how good a kitten is when you just walk in and, and meet some random kitten. How should you decide? Uh, I, I think you, you face questions like this in life a lot, where there's a sequence of things and you wonder, is there a better thing around the corner? Or should I at some point, you know, keep looking to find my dream thing? Or, you know, what point should I settle? And there's actually a really nice answer. This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We'd love to hear from you. Today's guest is Kevin Layton Brown, an award winning computer scientist focusing on predominantly two streams of research, one, algorithmic game theory, and two, empirical algorithms and machine learning. He is a professor of computer science at University of British Columbia and co-teaches two popular Coursera courses on game theory, which are approaching one million participants. In our conversation with Kevin, we cover why the intersection of economics and computer science is particularly fertile, the art and science of modeling human strategic interaction and incentives in multi-agent systems, his work with the Federal Communications Commission incentive auction, moral and ethical implications of artificial intelligence, using AI to do good, applying the kitten algorithm and much more. Tell us about your journey into computer science first and then into academia. Uh, well, I guess uh, I took a relatively direct path into academia. I uh, did uh, undergrad followed by a uh, a PhD program in, in the U.S. that uh, took people right out of undergrad. Um, probably the, the, I guess the, the funniest thing about my path into academia is that I lived in a part of Ontario, or it's a, a province in Canada called Ontario, which at the time had this crazy property that it had grade 13 in high school. So I'm probably the only person in the research community I know who went to grade 13, not because I was failed grade 12, but just because everyone did grade 13. But uh, other than that, um, I, I wrestled um, in undergrad with whether I should go into um, philosophy or computer science, because I really loved both of them. And it was a, a hard decision for me to decide which to do. And I guess in the end, um, I decided that being a computer scientist would just open so many more doors. Work that as a computer scientist is so much more exciting to do than the kind of work uh, available to philosophers. So um, that, that was sort of the main basis for making my decision. I think it was a pretty good basis for making the decision. Um, but I, I kind of remain um, interested in philosophical kinds of questions, um, which I think has informed my work um, as a researcher going forward. And I think that actually really shines through in your work. You have a way of describing things that is very accurate and deep as well, something that characterizes a philosopher. Your two main areas of focus or research right now seem to be algorithmic game theory and empirical algorithms and machine learning. Maybe talk about why they interest you and, and also maybe explain each area briefly. Sure. So, so I think something else that, that characterizes work in philosophy, um, from my perspective outside philosophy, is that it's at least as interested in asking the right questions and deciding which questions are interesting to think about as it is in the answers. And I think that kind of aesthetic um, informs my work and maybe you know, forms a bit of a, a backstory to why each of those two areas you mentioned is of interest to me. Thinking about algorithmic game theory, uh, this is basically the kind of interdisciplinary meeting place between microeconomic theory from economics and um, algorithms and uh, computer science more broadly on the CS side, um, you know, particularly CS theory. And uh, essentially, economists have been asking for a long time, 
how how can we make predictions about how people would behave in novel strategic interactions between each other? How can we use those kinds of predictions to design uh, what economists call mechanisms, um, kind of formal protocols for interaction between uh, self-interested people and, and show that we've done a good job of designing such a protocol? So say that this protocol uh, maximizes social welfare um, in the sense that it makes good decisions that um, everybody in society would benefit from, or this mechanism maximizes revenue, um, or this, maximi- this mechanism collects as little money as possible from the participants while making a good choice, or something like that. Um, so, so economics has thought a lot about that kind of framework. Computer science, um, and I guess AI in particular, have, have thought a lot about really very similar similar mathematical models that engage with um, models of agency, probabilistic reasoning, um, utility trade-offs between different outcomes, but has taken a much more computational angle on it. So computer scientists are, are much more concerned with um, what's tractably computable, what, what kinds of um, strategies can work within a, a sort of bounded amount of comp- computational time. And they're also much more interested in sort of practical learning from data. So kind of machine learning type approaches that try to use finite samples from the world to do as, as well as possible in, in building some kind of model of how the world works and incorporating that into a decision-making procedure. So, so really these two fields think about very similar kinds of questions that they each have rich um, sets of theoretical tools that people can draw on. And until kind of the the late 90s, they almost didn't talk to each other at all. They were, they were almost unaware of each other's existence. And so I, I was kind of in the right place at the right time. I was a Stanford student in the, the late 90s at a time when these fields were just discovering each other. Really because of the internet, uh, they were coming to, you know, computer scientists were starting to realize that computer systems, it, it didn't make sense to think of the users of a computer system as being entirely cooperative. Um, that might seem so obvious today that it's hard to see why that would have been surprising, but, um, you know, computer systems were initially built kind of with one user, and then eventually they were built with sort of a set of users who all worked for the same company, and if somebody misbehaved, you would walk down the hall and knock on their door and say, cut it out, you know, I need to share this resource with you. <laughs> and now we live in a world with you know, all kinds of misbehavior from marketers to hackers to people who just want to use a system in entirely different ways. And and so we really think of computer systems as arenas in which different uh, agendas get kind of uh, traded off against each other and played out. And uh, and that's really the realm of game theory. That you know, economics is fundamentally about modeling what happens when people with different interests come into contact with each other, uh, and. Um, game theory is essentially a name for the the mathematical approach of uh, of, of thinking about people with different interests and, and how they um, interact. So, so it really made sense all of a sudden for these two fields to come together. I guess uh, from the econ perspective, it made sense because economists started asking more and more adventurous questions about um, building more and more complicated kinds of systems, uh, in part because of uh, computers getting more powerful and markets starting to move online and become electronically mediated and they needed to turn to computer scientists to um to think about uh, how to do that um, so broadly speaking i guess that's uh, that's what algorithmic game theory is all about um, you asked about a second um area as well so you know i guess in computer science you've probably heard about the the sort of major philosophical question in computer science uh, you know which you can win a million dollar prize um, from the clay mathematical institute for answering which is um, does p equal np you know for your listeners um you know p is the class of problems that uh, a regular computer a non-deterministic uh, turing machine uh, which is a sort of mathematical model of a regular computer, can solve in, a, in polynomial time. So the, the number of steps that it takes to solve the problem is some polynomial function of the size of the input. Mm-hmm. And um, broadly speaking, problems in P are reasonably tractable. They're reasonably fast to solve on, on a computer. They, they don't you know, scale too badly with their inputs. What What's really bad in... in um, Scaling is problems that take an exponential amount of time to solve. So that, that would be problems that are outside of the class of polynomial functions. Then the next class up would be exponential functions. And 
you know, if a, fun, if a, if a, uh, that, that's sort of like, you know, a, a combination lock, you know, the, the number of, of moves that you have to make to, to try everything on a combination lock is exponential in the, in the description of the, the combination lock size. Um, that, that just quickly becomes intractable really, really fast. You add one more digit to the combination in a combination lock, it gets harder and harder to, to guess a combination. So problems that, that take exponential time to solve are going to be really awful. Turns out that there's a lot of problems in computer science that belong to this class called NP, which is like combination locks in the sense that if, if somebody gives you the answer, you can check the answer really quickly. Here's my combination lock and here's the combination. Can you check whether um, that combination is correct? That You could do that in polynomial time. There's a linear time algorithm. You type the combination into the lock and if it opens, that was the right combination. But guessing the combination, trying every combination to try to figure out what the combination is would take you exponential time in the worst case. I'm simplifying a bit because we have to talk about actually specifying the whole problem and here the kind of combination lock is a black box. So this example isn't exact, but it, it gives you a sense of, of what it is to be able to check a problem tractably, but for it to be very hard to find a solution if, if one isn't already given to you. And with a little bit of hand-waving, that's what the class of NP-complete problems is. It's problems uh, that are easily guessable. Uh, sorry, they're, they're very hard to guess, but they're e easy to check if somebody was to give you an answer. Turns out a lot of really important problems in computer science belong to this class. Uh, that you know, if I had a kind of magic computer that could always make the right guess, or, or equivalently, if I could check, if somebody were to give me the answer and I wanted to check it, problems would be really easy. But if I don't have this information, the best algorithms we know about today, in the worst case, would take exponential time. Yeah. And here's the really surprising thing. Nobody has been able to prove after kind of 50 years of um, having this problem stated really cleanly, whether NP and P are the same thing or not. So whether magical guessing is more powerful than methodical search. And it feels like magical guessing would be a really powerful thing. It would, it would give you, you know, extra computational power, even in the worst case, as compared to, you know, having to be completely deterministic and methodical. And crazily enough, computer scientists have not been able to formally separate these two classes of computational problems, uh, which is why this kind of is P equal to NP question is so perplexing to computer scientists. Uh, of course, essentially all computer scientists believe that P is not equal to NP, that these things are different, that just nobody's been able to show it. Here's, though, the, the sort of empirical flip side of that that is, I think, at least as important uh, for your listeners to understand and maybe less well understood in computer science. The fact that even if P is not equal to NP, which we all kind of believe is true, it's also the case that most NP-complete problems, most problems that belong to these so-called intractable classes are actually pretty easy to solve. It's actually pretty hard to find examples of NP-complete problems that we can't solve quickly. And there's this whole kind of subculture in AI of researchers who build algorithms to solve NP-complete problems as quickly as possible. And strangely enough, this is possible to do. <laughs> you know, if, if you think of NP-complete problems as being kind of like combination locks, you would think you know, nobody can come up with a good algorithm for opening combination locks. It's really just brute force try everything. But in fact, NP-complete problems have a certain kind of structure that you can see from the problem input. And people have had quite a lot of success in reasoning about the kind of structure given in, in the problem formulation and using it to make algorithms that you can't prove anything about. They still take exponential time in the worst case, as far as anybody can tell. And, and, and often about the specific algorithms you can prove, they really would take exponential time in the worst case. But in practice, they often do way, way better. And this uh, algorithm of uh, empirical algorithmics area that I work in is really interested in the question of how we could design such algorithms. It's not so much interested in the, the actual algorithms themselves, just you know manually coming up with algorithms for one problem after another. But it's interested in this more philosophical question of why this works at all, how we, you know, what kind of general recipes we can use to do this kind of design, and. In, you know, then applying these kinds of general recipes to solving important optimization problems that arise uh, in practice. You alluded to employing different interdisciplinary approaches to your work. How has this manifested itself? Sure. 
I think th- this stuff is all really interdisciplinary. You know, game theory has its roots in fixed point theorems in math and, uh, you know, ultimately kind of got adopted by economists. Now it's uh, a lot of the uh, heat in game theory is happening in uh, computer science departments, drawing on some tools from statisticians. It's also been applied quite a lot in the operations research community. And uh, I think some of the most exciting current work in game theory um, leverages ideas from psychology. So it tries to think or cognitive science kinds of uh, research that tries to think about cognitive biases that people have the way that actual people behave in strategic situations rather than trying to uh, take some kind of really simple positivistic kind of model of uh, rational behavior that uh, sort of classical economics is founded on, but instead some kind of much more nuanced, um, psychologically plausible model of behavior. So there's already a, a broad swath of interdisciplinary connections just on the game theory side, on uh, the Empirical algorithmic side, you know, this um, leans heavily on computer science theory, combinatorics, math, uh, artificial intelligence. And then I guess my own direction in this field is to try to apply machine learning ideas to the design and analysis of algorithms. So trying to see algorithm design itself as a machine learning problem or as an automatic experimental design kind of problem. So leveraging ideas from um, statistics and probability theory to to better think about the design of algorithms. Do you have any favorite concepts or mental models that you tend to instinctively revert to? So, for example, for myself, I, I tend to really like the concept of opportunity cost. For me, it has quite a bit of explanatory power to thinking about various phenomena and aspects of this world. Let me give you one, um, one good uh a concept there that I think is at least somewhat generally applicable. I think one really useful mental model that I find myself turning to frequently is the idea of overfitting from machine learning. So th- this is the idea that um, you you can, if you try to build a model with um, too many parameters based on too little data, it's possible to to overfit your model to your data in a way that will generalize poorly. So what this means is you 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 might become overconfident in the values that your parameters should take. You can find some setting of your parameters that will explain the data you've seen. And then when new data comes along generated by the same process that made your old data, um, it might uh, it might be that the parameters that you've chosen do a very bad job of, um, of predicting that new data. So you've kind of memorized your data, but you haven't actually found a model that says anything about the world. This is a kind of classical issue in machine learning, but I think this arises in kind of data-driven applications all over the place. You know, I think we're getting to a point where a lot of the um, the reasoning that we do is in some sense a machine learning problem. And so I think we can, we can discover this kind of concept of overfitting again and again. And I think having some, some facility with sort of how this problem arises, how you can detect it, uh, how you can try to mitigate it, it, it's a really powerful thing to understand. How would you characterize the evolution of algorithmic game theory? I think maybe in the early days, people were really excited that to discover that these two fields deserve to be talking to each other at all. There was kind of maybe an initial phase where the computer scientists tried to persuade the economists to notice um, that they each had something to contribute to each other. And there was a, a sort of second phase where everyone recognized that this was important and there were some kind of key theoretical questions that um, were receiving a lot of uh, attention from both sides. And, uh, and you know, there's a sort of very fruitful period of speaking the same language to each other. And I, I think maybe we're now in a third phase where people are starting to question some of those underlying models. You know, I think in the second phase, the computer scientists essentially adopted their models from economics. To some extent, they uh, they proposed new models, but the, the set of questions was sort of relatively orthodox. I think now people are much more experimental about trying to come up with new types of models that would uh, better fit reality uh, rather than trying to cut their teeth on kind of classical problems from economics that everyone agrees are hard. I think people are especially concerned with um, whether these models really make sense and you know, how to make them make more sense. So that I think there's a bit more of a focus on application. 
and a little bit more of a machine learning kind of flavor, more, more desire for technologies to be data-driven rather than entirely analytic. If you would juxtapose the domain or field of game theory with behavioral game theory and algorithmic game theory, and you would distill the, the key differences between those fields, what would those be? Sure. Let me first of all do game theory versus behavioral game theory, because there's a really clean distinction there. Kind of classical mainstream game theory is... Um, asks the question, you know, what would happen in a game where a game is described by a set of players, a set of actions or policies that they could each follow. So, you know, there's a set of inter- you know, ways they're each allowed to act in some kind of interaction where they affect each other. And then a utility function that says, based on which action or which policy each of us adopts, how happy would we each be? So, so fundamentally, that, that's what a game is. It's sort of easiest to think of a game as a sort of rock, paper, scissors kind of interaction where we each pick something and then something happens. But we could equally think of a game as something like a game of chess or a game of poker, where uh, the interaction between us might be you know, iterative and nuanced, and we might each observe things about the other person. We might only observe some things, like in poker, and, and we play out some policy, and eventually uh, we get some utility. But we can sort of, in a sense, understand that as being just the same as, as the game of rock, paper, scissors. You, you could imagine playing a game of poker where you articulate your exact policy to a friend who then goes and represents you at the poker tournament. Uh, there might be some kind of communication complexity barrier to actually doing that. But in principle, you could imagine saying everything about in every situation what you would want to do. Your friend would know everything about your strategy. And so you know, you and I both picked strategies through the instructions we gave our respective friends. And then the poker tournament happens and somebody comes home with a bunch of money. So that's that's what a game theorist thinks that a game is, is, is this sort of abstract concept of a bunch of players, a bunch of actions or policies for each of them, and a utility function that says how happy they are at the outcome. A, in classical game theory, so the key question is how how should we think that everyone is going to choose their actions? You know, what what, what is it sensible to predict? What, what, what are the kind of meaningful outcomes that could arise in a game? And in classical game theory, we make the assumption that everybody is an expected utility maximizer. We say everyone is going to do the thing that makes them the best off they can be. And it turns out that that still doesn't fully specify what would happen because based on what you believe about what I'm going to do, you're going to find that different policies that you might follow would be better and worse for you. So you kind of need both to think about where are your beliefs about me going to come from and also how are you then going to choose your own actions. That, that's what makes game theory a bit complicated. But but all of classical game theory, more or less, is based on this sort of rational idea that says you're going to be interested in taking actions that are the best for you based on the utilities in the game and uh, your own beliefs about me. So to, to digress for a second, the idea of a Nash equilibrium, which is a, a really fundamental concept in game theory, a really kind of good thing to understand, and you know, maybe one of these concepts like opportunity cost that, that I return to, because it's a really fundamental uh, idea that I think um, is one of the real contributions of game theory. After all, it's the reason that John Nash got the Nobel Prize. Um, it is the idea of you and me both picking actions in a game in a way that is um, sort of self-reinforcing or stable. So it says, what should I believe that you're going to do? Well, Nash equilibrium is a belief that I have about your actions. Let me say this a different way. And Nash equilibrium is a set of predictions about what each of us is going to do, which has the property that if I pull you out and I say, here's what everybody else is going to do, what would you like to do that is going to be the best thing for you in response? Your answer is going to be the thing that I'm already predicting for you. So for each person, I'm going to predict for them that they're going to choose the best thing they could do in response to the prediction about everybody else. And if I can find such a prediction where everybody is choosing the best response they could make to everybody else all at the same time, that's that object is what we call a Nash equilibrium. And John Nash's kind of deepest, most fundamental contribution about Nash equilibrium was to show that in every single game, no matter how many actions it has, how many players it has, what the numbers are that constitute the utilities, there's always at least one Nash equilibrium. So that means 
if I want to make a prediction that says people will always play in Nash equilibrium, you know, first of all, that's sort of normatively powerful because it means I'm telling everyone to do the best possible thing uh, for themselves based on accurate beliefs about everybody else. There's something kind of consistent. There's something kind of normatively powerful about it, and it's always going to exist. And so that key insight that said, you know, this sort of model of rational behavior about multiple people interacting with each other actually makes sense. It's coherent. It's it's never going to give you a vacuous answer that just says, in this game, you know, I have no idea what to predict. And that's why people care so much about Nash equilibrium. That really kind of got game theory off the ground as a way of thinking about strategic behavior. So that's kind of classical game theory. Classical game theory is more than just Nash equilibrium. It's rationality kind of broad, more broadly. But the Nash equilibrium is probably the fundamental idea of classical game theory. Behavioral game theory says, all right, you know, nice idea. Nash equilibrium is a beautiful thing. But how good is it at actually predicting what people really do when they're faced with strategic interactions with each other? Let's get a bunch of human beings and pay them money to go to a psychology lab and play games with each other. <laughs> Let's find out what they actually do. And the answer is um, Nash equilibrium sometimes is a, is a pretty solid prediction. But just as often, it's a pretty lousy prediction. Pretty often, Nash equilibrium just does not do a good job predictively of saying how people really will reason. And that's a bit depressing if you're a game theorist. Conversely, though, in order for me to make a sweeping statement like that, it must be the case that there's something consistent that people do in different kinds of games. And so behavioral game theorists say, let's not be depressed by the failure of Nash equilibrium to describe actual people. Let's kind of see this as a machine learning problem. Let's try to build models that robustly do a good job of describing what people actually do. So if I say, you know, you have a recency bias or you have a framing bias or you have a you know, tendency to like to pick round numbers or you have a tendency to care about fairness or all of these, uh, these kinds of uh, cognitive biases that you might have heard about, these are all kinds of claims that in behavioral game theory that say, you know, you're not just picking the, the very best outcome in, in the sort of Nash equilibrium sense, but instead, you know, you're reasoning in some kind of uh, coherent, reproducible, predictable way. It's just, you know, a different way than, than maximizing your utility. So, so that, that, that's sort of fundamentally the difference in behavioral game theory. It, it assumes that people are predictable but not necessarily that they're rational or expected utility maximizers. And then algorithmic game theory? So algorithmic game theory is, is basically um, less clearly defined than, than the other two. Work in computer science that cares about game theory and that, that looks at it through an algorithmic lens. So computer scientists are particularly interested in asking, you know, what is the process by which I arrive at my strategy? And what are the kinds of questions that I might ask about that process? Like, you know, one process I might want to take let's say, could take exponential time because I, you know, if I want to think about um, how should I play a game of Go or how should I play a game of poker, the easiest thing I can say is, you know, I'd follow a minimax strategy. I'd build out the whole game tree and propagate actions up in a minimax way. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it. But I might stipulate some kind of simple algorithm that has provable optimality properties. And then I might say, but I could never run that algorithm. I would need uh, a computer that's faster than any computer that will ever be built. I would need a hard drive that's bigger than any hard drive that will ever be built. What could I do on a real computer? That's not really a question economists have ever asked. They, they tend to be happy with a theorem that says, here's the best algorithm, without, without worrying about what would happen if they couldn't run the best algorithm. So algorithmic game theorists kind of start from the limitations of feasible computers, you know, they might say, what could I do in polynomial time? Or what could I do with a bounded amount of storage space? And, and end up coming up with sort of approximation algorithms that aren't quite as good uh, as these sort of theoretical best algorithms, but that you could actually run. And how would you characterize the delta in a Nash equilibrium or Nash equilibria between, or, or once you introduce algorithmic game theory. So the same setup, but you're viewing the problem or the setup through a lens of algorithmic game theory versus, for example, game theory or behavioral game theory. What could be the potential delta in Nash equilibrium or Nash equilibria? So, so when you ask about the delta, delta measured in which units? Just discrepancy in outcome or difference in outcome in terms of 
equilibrium or equilibria, are they significant? Sometimes they're very significant. So, so I think that, that question is, uh, is probably harder than you mean for it to be. Uh, let me tell you why. <laughs> The the Nash equilibrium is, is a funny thing because it's not a it, most of the kind of concepts that we think of recommending you know what's the best model for making a prediction in this case or what's the um, best policy for flying an autonomous helicopter or something these are typically optimization problems and so there's a notion of I didn't get the optimum here but I got something that was pretty close to the optimum right. And I think that's the sense in which you were asking your question. The Nash equilibrium is not an optimality concept in that same way. It's a fixed point concept. Right? A Nash equilibrium is a system that's in balance. It's not necessarily a system that's optimizing something. It's a system that is in balance. That, that's why it, it, we use the word equilibrium. It connotes this, this idea of being in balance. So everybody is responding in a way to the other person that – that reinforces the behavior that they're getting from everybody else. So w when you have a dysfunctional relationship with, with a romantic partner or a friend where, you know, you keep doing the best you can, you know, they do something that really frustrates you and you're just doing the best you can to try to respond to them. But the thing that you do to respond, it's the best you can really frustrates them. And so mm -hmm. they, they do the best they can to respond in a way that fuels your behavior. And you, you just kind of each keep fueling each other. That's a Nash equilibrium. Right. You're, you're each doing a thing that from your perspective is the best thing to do in response to what the other person is doing. A Nash equilibrium is not necessarily a good thing. And this is a really fundamental thing to understand about a Nash equilibrium. It's, it's just it's stable. You know, if, if you keep doing your part of it, the other person's going to keep doing their part of it. And if nothing changes, you're just going to respond to each other forever in this way. But, but that doesn't necessarily make it good. And the world is full of examples of bad Nash equilibria. You know, if everyone else cheats on their taxes, then the government's going to have no money to enforce tax compliance, and there's there's going to be no good public services, and I'm not going to get anything anyway. I'm not going to feel a sense of affiliation with my society, so I'm not going to pay my taxes either. So that would be an example of a bad equilibrium where nobody pays their taxes. But aren't we fundamentally saying here, though, that looking at the same problem through various lenses we are reaching different payoffs for each player, right? And if the payoffs change, the Nash equilibrium or equilibria will change as well. Isn't that correct? That's though? absolutely true, yeah. So wouldn't, wouldn't the premise... But, but so I when might... you say something like, you know, if I degrade the algorithm, you know, if I have to take a... use a tractable algorithm rather than some intractable algorithm, you know, how much is that going to change the, the Nash equilibrium? It, it could change it arbitrarily much. You know, we, we can find examples where... Um, where things just destabilize, you know, you blow up the Nash equilibrium, you end up with something really different that happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of like saying, you know, if I have a ball that's balanced on my table, and then I tilt the table just a little bit, how far might the ball fall before it, it gets to another stable state? The answer is it kind of depends on the geometry of the rest of your room, right? I mean, once you get it rolling off the table, who can say where it's going to go without understanding the whole room? We would love to learn more about your work and contributions in this area. What have you focused on? I guess I've focused on a couple of things. Um, one area I've worked on is, is in this kind of behavioral game theory space that I've described. So I've uh, thought a lot about using machine learning techniques to build good behavioral game theory models. Despite the way that I framed it, um, this is not something that, generally speaking, the field has done. Mostly people have been thinking about um, c uh, conducting human subject experiments, which are incredibly hard to do well, and uh, you know, forming theories about exactly what kinds of um, cognitive biases people might have, and then running experiments to try to show you know, within some space of cognitive biases that somebody cares about, and maybe also within some space of games, what, what kinds of parameters are well justified by the data. So there's, there's a, a relatively recent literature in economics that, that does behavioral game theory in that kind of way. And what I and my collaborators have been interested in doing is a, a much more kind of black box version of behavioral game theory that says, just give me a lot of data, give me a very flexible space of models, and let me return to you some kind of statistically sound prediction about what, what a good model in that space would be. So we've tried to kind of abstract away from the model families that people before us had come up with and, and use 
sort of more mainstream kinds of machine learning tools and, and maybe um, more powerful statistical methods to, to come up with uh, reproducible families of uh, behavioral game theory models that, that can be uh, pretty generally applied. So uh, our most recent work in this space has used, uh, has showed how to use deep learning models, for example, to, to do this kind of uh, uh, prediction. What's tricky about it is that the prediction problem is really different from the kinds of prediction problems that one normally sees in machine learning. So, you know, I don't want to say do like a classification task, right? The most obvious kind of machine learning is a classification where you say, here's a picture. Is this a picture of a dog or of a cat? So that's, that's a mapping from an input to a class, to a discrete value that says, you know, one for dog and two for cat. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a prediction where I show you a game, which is a, a matrix of arbitrary size. And the arbitrary size thing is a real problem for, uh, for machine learning. Usually, um, we want input, we would get inputs of a fixed size. So you would have an image uh, that's a known number of pixels um, by another known number of pixels. Um, you might think you could give it an arbitrary size image, but what they would actually do is just scale it to a, a fixed size input. Um, and then the, the thing that we want a prediction over is not a binary bunch of choices, but rather it's a probability distribution over all of the actions that were available to player one. And so if I gave you a three by two matrix where player one has three actions and player two has two actions, then I would want a probability distribution over three things. And if I gave you a 10 by 20 matrix, I would want a probability distribution over 10 things. So I want the size of my output to be different depending on the size of the input. And I want to learn a single model that will work on any game. So I want the same model once it's trained to be able to be evaluated on any game at all and to, to spit out an answer of the appropriate size. So and when, when you say any possible game, you're saying any possible <laughs> underlying data generating process, essentially. No, no. So I'm saying, given a data generating process, you're going to give me a bunch of data. I'm going to get a whole bunch of, I'm going to have some generating process that produces a lot of observations like that. Different games on which people did different things. And I might get many observations of people on the same game. That's fine. Then what I want at test time is that you can give me a new game that I didn't see before at training time. It might even be a different size than any game I saw before at training time. And it will make a prediction of what people will do on that game. Notice that's something Nash Equilibrium can do, right? If you get given a new game matrix that is a different size than anything you've ever seen before, I can find its Nash Equilibrium and I can, uh, I can return that as my prediction. So I'd like something that powerful that I can use um, based on behavioral data. Diving deeper into specific applications, you and your team recently won the Franz Edelman Award for Achievement in Operations Research and, and the Management Sciences. Tell us about the problem you solved. Sure. So that, that was a problem in market design, completely different from uh, the behavioral game theory problem I was just talking about, but uh, relevant to uh, both game theory and uh, empirical algorithmics. So there, the Federal Communication Commission in the United States wanted to reapportion radio spectrum that was previously allocated to television broadcast. And they wanted to sell it off um, to mobile phone companies because mobile phone usage is just much more important than broadcast TV to our economy today. And they, they previously allocated these licenses to broadcast uh, television stations. They didn't want to just confiscate them and take them back. They wanted instead to create a market in which television stations could voluntarily relinquish their broadcast rights, then take all of that spectrum that had been relinquished that they paid for, repackage it into contiguous blocks that would be usable by, by tel uh, mobile phone companies because they, they couldn't use a little bit of you know, a TV station that's allowed to broadcast over here in Philadelphia on Channel 17 and another TV station that's allowed to broadcast on Channel 32 over in New York. They need some big contiguous block. So, so do this kind of repackaging and then sell off those contiguous blocks. So this was a, a crazy kind of combinatorial auction design problem to think about how to do this simultaneous buyback and then resale in a way that would maximize the amount of spectrum that could be cleared, 
meet all kinds of different constraints the government had about preserving interference constraints among the television broadcasters that would remain to make sure that the the TV ban plan would work, to ensure that uh, as much kind of social good was achieved as possible, to turn a good profit for the government, to make sure the government didn't lose money, have to subsidize this market. So this was a huge project that involved many people all over, um, mostly the U.S., but uh, all around the world. I worked with a team of Stanford economists that thought about particularly the design of this auction, but there were other parts that that, uh, different people worked on uh, to do with repackaging afterwards, coming up with opening prices, all these different moving parts. So my part in particular was to think about this repacking problem of um, how can I assign new channels to the TV stations that don't buy out their licenses so that I have enough free space left over from the people who did relinquish their licenses that I could turn around and sell it off. And um, we we could then use that information to come up with um, a pricing mechanism to decide how much we should um, offer to the different stations, basically so that we wouldn't we would preserve a big contiguous blocks that we could sell off. And uh, that turns out to be an empirical algorithm question. That's a, a what's called a graph coloring problem, which is an NP complete problem to to figure out how to do this repacking well. And so we used our Um, automatic algorithm design ideas uh, based on the sort of empirical algorithmics perspective that that we were discussing before to build uh, such a market clearing algorithm. And the reason that machine learning was interesting here is that we knew in advance that we were going to be dealing with um, graph coloring problems that uh, arose from the constraint graph of the United States. We weren't, we weren't concerned with kind of arbitrary inputs. We were concerned with the kinds of inputs that could arise under our problem. Uh, from our geographical constraints. And so we generated lots and lots of example problems um, based on the U.S. constraint graph. And uh, we then tuned an algorithm that was designed to do really well on exactly those problems and no others. Uh, and it did really well in the, in the real auction. And uh, the U.S. ended up clearing 100 and... Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to forget the number off the top of my head, but... Uh, uh, something on the order of 100 megahertz of spectrum. I think it, I think it was 126 megahertz of spectrum, but I might be wrong. And uh, and and yielding a profit of almost 20 billion dollars that went to uh, debt reduction in the United States. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, and uh, gross revenues of 20 billion dollars, about 10 billion dollars of which went back to uh, TV stations to to pay them off. Uh, to to make them uh, compensated for for relinquishing their licenses, so so it was this huge thing that basically half of the TV stations in the United States, or half the TV spectrum in the United States, um, is uh, going away over the next couple of years as a result of this auction, and it's being um, it's being resold to uh, mobile phone companies, and and people's phones are going to work better as a result. And just to give folks a rough sense, how long did it take to complete this work? The auction itself took 13 months just to run. Uh, once you know it actually got started, everything was settled. You know, nothing was changed about the software, about the rules of the auction. The the actual process from you know, Congress passed a law saying it was possible for this auction to happen. Then you know we started consulting on it, and all kinds of public disclosure and feedback rounds and changes and software development. That whole process took about six or seven years. What does the future hold? What's your focus of study, research? I think I'm really, you know, I'm doing lots of different things at the same time. Some of them are, you know, abstract mathematical questions uh, about, you know, different families of learning models or different kinds of algorithm design questions. You know, I have uh, half a dozen different students and they're all doing different things. Um, but one direction that I'm really excited about doing more work in that I uh, haven't really discussed with you yet is... Uh, what people call artificial intelligence for the social good. And uh, I'm really interested in finding ways of taking um, ideas from AI and you know, given my interests, uh, particularly maybe uh, within algorithmic game theory, and um, trying to find um, socially beneficial ways of uh, applying these ideas to maybe to problems that uh, aren't getting a lot of attention from the corporate sector. One problem that I've been working on for a long time has been trying to help farmers in developing countries find markets for their crops. So building um, two-sided markets that can help uh, subsistence farmers to um, match up with uh, agricultural traders and uh, 
essentially these markets uh, have, have very bad um, information flow currently. People tend to trade with people they already know. And so it can be really hard for farmers to sell. As a result, they can get really terrible prices. And it's not good for buyers either because buyers uh, aren't always able to find good trading partners. So we've been working uh, for uh, seven or eight years now in Uganda, um, building a, a, a real system that you know, works over um, the kind of simple SMS-based mobile phones that people have in Uganda to uh, to enable uh, real money trades um, of this kind. It's kind of um, Craigslist meets the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, it's Craigslist in the sense that it's random people selling you know their own personal goods. It's not big companies. But it's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the sense that it's uh, people selling commodities rather than selling just arbitrary things. And uh, we, we've had a, a couple of million dollars of, uh, of trade happen over the platform just in trades that we've actually verified by phoning people up and making sure that they were real. Probably a lot more than that um, in, in trades we haven't managed to verify. And uh, we're, we're now looking at trying to uh, you know, scale up that model, uh, make it more powerful and deploy it around the world. Uh, we're hoping uh, someday soon to be uh, deploying in Colombia, wow. and uh, and you know, we're we're making a, a free open source platform that uh, that other people can uh, can employ in in their own country if they're interested in this problem. That's just one example. We're also working with uh, food banks to to think about um, better mechanisms they can use for allocating food um, from kind of centralized depots to. To various different food banks around the city, which have a bit of an incentive to request more food than they really need. Um, so, trying to find mechanisms that uh, that can do a better job of solving that allocation problem. So, so all kinds of problems like this. Really, the sky is the limit for uh, for how we can use artificial intelligence ideas, um, which have just you know, so explosively started to uh, really have the capacity to to make big transformative changes. Um, I think it's really exciting to think about how we can do those in socially beneficial ways. Yeah, so true. There are moral and ethical dilemmas when it comes to the growth of artificial intelligence and its impact to humans. How do you see this debate evolving? I think people probably spend uh, too much time thinking about splashy instantiations of this question around consciousness and strong AI, you know, you know, are, are the robots going to take over and become smarter than people? I, I think you know Hollywood loves those kinds of questions, but I think they're they're given too much airtime, frankly. And I think not enough attention is paid to you know what what are the implications of AI going to be on the employment market and you know the average American life ten years from now, fifteen twenty years from now. I, I think. Um, we're we're focused too much on these sort of big intriguing questions and and not enough on the stuff that we could, we really ought to be able to see coming. I think it's pretty clear to people who work in tech. I would imagine it's probably pretty clear to the two of you that uh, the job market is just going to look pretty different in ten or twenty years than it does today. And I think we we need to be thinking a lot more about what those changes are going to be. Uh, what the policy responses to those changes are going to be, uh, how our society is going to adapt as a result, and maybe what the political impacts of these changes are going to be, and uh, what we should all do about it. Are there any approaches or frameworks which you've been mulling over that one could apply to do this responsibly? Well, I think uh, as a scientist, um, you know, I care about you know, just kind of engaging with the public and trying to help people understand what, you know, artificial intelligence can and can't do. I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. I think much of this is really about policy response and just, you know, trying to help uh, policymakers to, to understand what kinds of responses make sense. I think some kind of social safety net uh, is pretty important. I think you know, ultimately AI technology is going to make us all richer. It's going to make us able to you have machines do all kinds of useful things that people used to do. And that's going to mean more of us can have more of those things. That, that's, a, that's a good thing for society if we can pull that off. But at the same time, it's also going to mean that 
the the benefits of of those uh, breakthroughs are not necessarily going to be distributed equally. That's going to make society richer in the aggregate, but it's not necessarily going to make individual members of society richer. And you know, a choice that our society is going to have to think carefully about is how do we choose to um, shape our society in order to ensure that uh, we don't have large numbers of people who are really made worse off by these changes. And that's that's really a political question. It's a, a question for governments to think about how they want to run uh, their country. But I think those questions are going to become more and more acute as people feel these effects on their lives more and more strongly. Based on your experience, and you have such a rich experience in this area to what degree do you believe computers and human beings are complementary versus substitutes or sort of complements versus substitutes because if there's substitutes or they be move towards substitutes then this becomes much more of a real problem if there is complementary that persists over time this is lesser of a problem what's your sense I have no worry that all of the jobs are going away. I think that's uh, th that point of view is based on a enormous misunderstanding of economics. As long as you can think of something that you wish you could get a person to do, then there will still be jobs. Because all that a job is is somebody else you know, doing a task that that you would like to have done um, in exchange for some money, which is a placeholder for your own labor. So if we can all trade our labor, if we, if we can all find things that um, we can do that other people value, that's what a job is. We're, we're going to be fine uh, in, in kind of a capitalist economy. And I think it isn't hard to see all kinds of labor categories that we would love to have more people doing things if only um, – if only that labor was was cheap enough or um, you know mediated appropriately, for example, I think we could absorb endless amounts of labor in child care, teaching, coaching, counseling, these kinds of one on one service kinds of roles. The sky's the limit you know for how much we could um, we we could really do in terms of you know nursing elder care. You know, taking care of children. Um, it's not clear everybody wants those sorts of jobs, but I, I think there's a fairly limitless demand for those kinds of jobs. And nobody wants a robot taking care of their children. You know, Who knows? it's not a matter of, uh, you know, how well it could work. It's just a matter of socialization. Like, even if you had a fantastic childcare robot, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave my daughter with it. And, and as long as that's true, then, you know, there's going to be plenty of, of jobs in those kinds of sectors. But those might not be the sectors that displaced workers were previously working in. They might require retraining. There might be, you know, workers pretty late into their careers who aren't willing to work in those kinds of sectors. So I think the question is much less about whether uh, workers are, uh, you know, whether the aggregate number of jobs that society can support kind of lines up well with uh, the number of people in the society. I, I kind of feel strongly that we're going to be able to find a lot of things that, that people can usefully do. I, mean, I gave only one category of examples. I'm not trying to say everything is going to be elder care and child care, but I, I think just <laughs> right. that one example uh, is, is pretty powerful for seeing that there, we could imagine a, a differently structured society that would, they would be able to create a lot of jobs. Right. Um, but I think the more important question is um, what do we do with um, people who are disrupted by these changes? You know, what do we do with all the long haul truck drivers who I think are with high probability going to be replaced by self-driving trucks um, 10 or 20 years from now. You know, we may or may not have uh, self-driving cars on city streets, but, you know, self-driving trucks uh, operating mostly on major highways um, between distribution hubs is a much easier problem to solve. People are actively working on it. And that's a big industry. You know, those people are not all going to want to go become primary school teachers. So what's going to happen to them? I think that's an important question. Another important question is, what is the income distribution going to look like in this new economy? You know, I, I'm confident that we can find jobs for everybody, but I'm not confident that we're going to have a strong middle class in that economy. We might have a big kind of servant class and a very small, um, you know, kind of elite. That that might not be a, a politically stable outcome. It might not be a society that we're happy with. 
So I think these are the kinds of questions that we need to grapple with as a society. There'll certainly be distributional considerations to um, think deeply about. We've talked about some really fabulous and exciting and thrilling theoretical concepts. Let's talk about how one could potentially operationalize these theoretical concepts in everyday life. Do you have any recommendations on specifically how to incorporate game theor theoretic frameworks into day-to-day -day or, or everyday life? That's a tough question. You know, I think a lot of this stuff is, uh, is really about how to you know, build complex systems. It's not necessarily about something you can do in five minutes, uh, you know, to make your business more successful or something. You know, I think, frankly, um, if things were that easy, people would already know about them and uh, they, they wouldn't find uh, what I had to say very exciting. But there is a computational um, barrier, though, right? That's the thing. I, I mean, I do think... Um, uh, well, I, mean, I, I think to some extent players. these things are going to be commodified. You know, somebody's going to build a powerful thing that you're going to be able to use, um, sort of like Google, right? The search engine itself is incredibly complicated for somebody to build. Nobody's really going to tell you how to go make your own search engine, but it's going to become a consumer product that you can use. I think having some kind of um, you know game theoretic intelligence about uh, what your interests are, um, what it might look like to act on your behalf, I think we're going to start seeing some kind of you know AI agents that can um, do certain kinds of tasks for you, taking into account um, your interests. People have been talking about systems like that for a long time, and they're sort of gradually becoming more and more powerful. I think um, that that's the kind of thing that would start to affect people's lives in the next 10 or 20 years, but, but probably in a way that looks more like specifying your interests, and it comes back to you with some ideas of things that, that you might want to do. Um, you could imagine you know, shopping for a house that way. You know, a, a, Right. But this is something that you know goes through the real estate listings and makes different trade-offs for you based on your interests. But let's maybe um, focus on on you since you know these concepts cold. So so for example, is there in any context you would utilize your deep knowledge of Nash a Nash equilibrium in real life, for example, buying a house, negotiating a compensation package, etc. You know, there's little kind of episodic um, sort of tricks that I've run into that I think are uh, are usable in daily life. I'm not sure they're the kind of the distillation of, of all of these you know concepts in the most fundamental way, but there there's they're some sort of little life hacks maybe that I, I've run into. One that uh, that I thought was pretty cool uh, was uh, I think work from um, either Janet Yellen, the the former uh, Fed chairman, or her husband. I forget which of them had studied um, you know, hiring personal employees like nannies or yard workers or whatever. Uh, and they'd found that uh, it made sense to pay um, somebody that you really like um, more than the market wage, which is a kind of surprising thing for an economist to recommend doing. But they recommended paying, you know, they, they looked into the effects of paying somebody, say, like 5 or 10% more than, than the going wage in the, in the market. And they found that this could make sense in, in Nash Equilibrium, because uh, it would reduce turnover, it would make an employee much more loyal and much more interested to retain this higher paying job and therefore to do really good work. So, so in any kind of job where the employee might um, be able to make a decision about how hard to work, it, it could make sense to pay too much so that the employee continued to work really hard in the hopes of holding on to this job that, that um, was working out so well for them. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of counterintuitive, but kind of actionable. Yeah. Something else that I think is is useful is what's uh, what's called the uh, secretary algorithm, or uh, what I called uh, to my girlfriend the kitten algorithm. This is uh, a, a kind of classical problem in computer science that really uh, usefully comes up. The kind of canonical story is you have to hire a secretary. Secretaries are going to come into your office. You're going to interview them, and then you have to either hire one or decide not to hire them, and then they go away forever, and you don't get to go back and hire them because they'll get snapped up by somebody else. And and this uh, became useful in my life because my partner and I wanted to adopt a kitten. And in Vancouver, the way this works is there's this one kitten adoption agency that kind of has a stranglehold on all the kittens, <laughs> Vancouver Orphan Kitten Rescue. And at a particular season of the year, uh, all the, kitten, the kittens tend to get born in the springtime, 
and uh, you you go around um, visiting uh, these foster homes that have a kitten, and you have to decide: I will adopt that cat right now, or I'm going to leave, and some couple is going to show up ten minutes later, and they might adopt the cat. So you pretty much have to make a decision on the spot. And th- the algorithmic question that people ask uh, here is: w- What's the right thing to do? You know when. You don't know anything about the distribution of quality. In our case, you know, you have no idea how to assess how good a kitten is when you just walk in and, and meet some random kitten. How should you decide? Uh, I think you, you face questions like this in life a lot, where there's a sequence of things and you wonder, is there a better thing around the corner? Or should I at some point, you know, keep looking to find my dream thing? Or, you know, what point should I settle? Yep. And there's actually a really nice answer which is you should look at a constant number of things at the beginning. There's actually a formula. I think it's a, um, a one over E fraction of something, but, but never mind. Uh, you should look at a small number of things at the beginning and reject them no matter what. And uh, it turns out when my uh, partner and I went and, and looked at kittens, the first kittens we saw were incredible. She really loved them. She just wanted to adopt them. And so I told her about the secretary algorithm. I called it the kitten algorithm. And I said, what we need to do is reject these first kittens, even though they're fantastic. And then what we need to do is keep going. And the next time we find kittens that are better than the first ones, then we take that we take those subsequent ones. So generally in the algorithm, you, you pick some constant number of things you're going to reject. You reject them no matter what, but then you use that to set a baseline. And the next time you exceed that baseline, that's when you stop. And you can prove that uh, if things are coming in random order, you're going to do almost as well as possible by following a strategy like this. And uh, it worked out well for us. We got great kittens. You know, the the second and third kittens were not very good. My uh, partner was starting to get very concerned that computer science was going to have ruined her life. So (laughs) the fourth kittens were really cute. And then she became a believer. Moving on to last set of questions, which hopefully are quick. What motivates you? <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like a question that would necessarily be quick, uh, but I'll, I'll try to give a quick answer to it. Uh, I think I'm most motivated by trying to find um, different angles on research questions that, that for some reason I think are kind of underexplored and trying to do, do work that, that kind of gives a proof of concept that shows that people should be thinking about a question in a different way. So I think most there, there are a lot of different ways of being an academic. I think some people just try to write as many papers as they can, no matter what. Other people try to find really hard problems and um, you know manage to knock down some really tough question that somebody else posed. You know, I think what I really try to do is find new questions that I think people should be asking. And you know, I, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to you know really knock down an open problem that has been kicking around for 50 years. I, I think I'm much more likely to propose a problem and, and try to persuade people of why they should be asking that question. How do you allocate your time? Uh, it's tough. I mean, I guess like everybody else, I've got a calendar. I, uh, you know, I try to block things off. I, I try to give myself blocks of time where I can do um, big, interesting things instead of being constantly reactive. But uh, in the world of uh, electronic communication, it's difficult. I'm sitting in my office at 8.30 at night talking to you, so uh, <laughs> one might wonder how I allocate my time, whether I'm doing the best I could. But, uh, Touche. You know, I, <laughs> what, can, what can I say? Brilliant. Let's shift to a question that can sometimes be a little tricky or tough to answer. Which contrarian belief or beliefs do you hold near and dear? All right. Um, Do you have any sort of deep philosophical ideas or thoughts that you feel run opposed to what's the societal norm or what folks in general think? um, It's a little bit more specific to my own field than being a a broad kind of societal claim. Um, So so I think maybe I think of two. Um, One is that I, I tend to think that what makes a really good computer scientist um, depends a lot more on communication, writing, and argument skills rather than kind of raw technical horsepower. I think computer scientists tend to really emphasize sort of math and coding skills and uh, to really de-emphasize the sort of humanities uh, argumentation and communication 
sort of side of uh, themselves. But in my experience, that um, you know, looking at people who are really good communicators, really clear thinkers, really persuasive, I, I find that that often really correlates with the people who are going to do great technical work. Because I think while having a, a set of technical skills is valuable, I think uh, it's easy to to use that kind of technical horsepower in a really uninteresting direction. I think I, we see a lot of people who do that. And uh, I think it's necessary to, to have a bit of a broader view, to be able to ask really interesting questions, to, to have a, a big impact. I, I think the people that I respect the most in my field are people who I think do that. Um, I think the other kind of uh, thing that I've been a bit divergent on is uh, is something that's becoming a bit more of a truism today than when I started caring about it. But it's the importance of sort of statistically valid kind of data-driven solutions as compared to analytically valid solutions that you can prove a theorem arguing for. I think computer science really has a bias towards a result that you can prove a theorem about that says this thing is absolutely true. Uh, here's a, a you know tight analytic mathematical argument that shows that this claim is true. That's sort of the gold standard for what people appreciate in our field, and, and for good reasons. But there are a lot of questions that we just don't have the analytical tools to be able to make a statement like that about. And I think, I think we should care less about doing that kind of work and care more about trying to find solutions that um, work well on the, the distributions of problems that we actually encounter, even if we can say very little about them in general. Yeah. And I think the success of machine learning over the last kind of half decade in particular has um, made this point of view much more mainstream because um, we have a lot of approaches that we can say very little about in the worst case that uh, that are just so uh, embarrassingly effective that uh, everyone's kind of getting on that train. Let's talk about what you're currently reading. Any articles, books, papers, etc. Anything that's captivating you at the moment? You know, I I, uh, I guess I have a, a diet that kind of combines uh, you know what's going on currently in the world, what's going on in my field, and just some fiction to help me get away from it all. You know, in in the news, I I concentrate mostly on the Economist and the New York Times. The New York Times for whatever is going on in the moment, and The Economist for a bit of a broader view that is uh, a little bit less focused on the United States. Yeah, I'm also an, so an Economist junkie. <laughs> yeah, you know, where else are you going to find out that you know the finance minister of Bolivia has been in a corruption scandal or something? You know, not not, not that that particular yeah. thing is true, but uh, you know, it's sort of heartwarming to find out about the rest of the world. And also, their coverage of actual economics is uh, is pretty great. And I guess I teach uh, a course on computer science and society, so I'm, I'm particularly uh, also interested in uh, in tracking the kind of ethical questions, new technologies that people are freaking out about, that kind of thing. In my field, uh, I'm I think I just endlessly feel that I could um, benefit by knowing more about uh, the forefront of machine learning and statistics. So lately, I'm doing a lot of reading on uh, bandits algorithms, which it's kind of a framework for thinking about um, automatic experimental design. I think these methods are poised for a breakthrough. I think we're going to start using them in a broader family of settings than, than we've been doing so far. I think they, they're really poised to be a, uh, a valuable set of tools. So that's something I'm trying to learn more about. Also trying to learn more about um, how to build models that are causally correct, that, that can tell the difference between uh, causation and correlation, which there's also a, a rich literature on. Which would be amazing. I mean, it's possible to do. You have to make assumptions about uh, about counterfactuals in one way or another, but uh, but it's not impossible. You know, it's data hungry. It's more trouble. Uh, everyone's always uh, glad to just kind of glom onto the the correlation, particularly when it tells a nice story. It's the holy grail, essentially. Well, it's certainly at least uh, a, a a really powerful piece of the scientific puzzle. Uh, there, there's a, a good new book on this subject by Yuta Pearl, which I would recommend to anyone who's interested in it. How can listeners learn, find out more about your work? Uh, well, you can uh, uh, look me up online. I've got a web page with pointers to all kinds of different uh, scientific articles and you know, interviews and things. I'm sure um, the podcast will have a link to it. Uh, I also teach a course on Coursera about game theory. So I think uh, we, we've already had three quarters of a million people take this course. So you know, three quarters of a million people on the internet can't be wrong, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so I recommend that. It's a course on just you know 
we really pull no punches in that course. It's just a bunch of math about game theory. We we never designed it thinking we were going to get you know almost a million people to take it. But uh, there's really an appetite out there by you know intelligent people such as yourselves who don't happen to be in a university and just want to roll up their sleeves and learn more. And that course really seems to have struck a chord with people. So you know if you'd like to learn about some of these same concepts, you know, in a little bit more of a rigorous way, uh, I think that's a great place to uh, to go learn more. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization company or management they may be associated with and thank you for listening